Hello everyone again uh, and welcome to the symposium, the second session on international uh, case studies and I would like to start by thanking our three speakers, David Roberts, Emilio Silva and Marcel uh, per Perelman for being with us uh, today. Uh, as you know, this morning we started to discuss the legal, historical, but also philosophical context of statutory limitations in the case of gross human rights violations. And we also started to discuss the Turkish case in a broader framework. Now, the aim of this second session is to introduce three case studies from different countries, the United Kingdom, and the crimes committed by the colonial empire, Spain and Argentina. And today's three speakers have been all involved at different levels in struggle to hold accountable the perpetrators of gross human rights violations which were perpetrated decades ago. So why did we decide to have such a session? Obviously, we are aware that all cases are context-sensitive, that they took place in very different legal frameworks, in very different political situations, and with different social dynamics. But at the same time, as we started to discuss this morning, international human rights principles and mechanisms are crucial to understand the statutory limitations and the struggle against them in the context of gross human rights violations. In addition, there have been a lot of uh, exchanges between local and international dynamics, that is activists, lawyers, but also victims and victims' families have been, have been learning and have been inspired from other experiences in the world. And we know the experience of uh, the martyrs of the Plaza del Mayo in Argentina, for instance, in the case of enforced disappearances. So it's interesting to discuss this example to understand better these dynamics between the local and the global levels to develop new strategies, but also new solidarities to fight these crimes. In addition, we also know that the states also learn from each other. They learn mechanisms of crimes, but also mechanisms of impunity. They are in solidarity often to protect the perpetrator by refusing their extradition or by preventing cases to be brought. Before giving the floor to our three speakers, I would like to uh, mention three main dimensions which I think will be common in the three presentations and which are also very relevant to Turkey. The first one is that we are dealing with long-term and difficult struggles, facing multiple obstacles at multiple levels. Legal obstacles, obviously statutory limitations, which are the topic of today's conference, but also amnesty laws, and in a more broader way, political obstacles, systemic impunity, memory loss, politics of forgetting and of denial. Another obstacle, obviously, is time itself, time passing, which makes it increasingly difficult to collect evidence, to collect testimonies, with the survivors or their relatives getting older or dying. And this also applied to the perpetrators. So there is a need to think the judicial struggle in a bigger context and in a different way. The second common point of these cases, and which is also relevant uh, of Turkey, is that we are not dealing only with legal struggles, with l struggles which are led by lawyers only. We are uh, witnessing coalitions of actors, including lawyers, but also 
civil society, and when I mention civil society, I mention both civil society organization, but the society more broadly, in the sense that you need to engage the public, you need to raise awareness about this crime to make more pressure at the political levels to fight impunity and hold accountable the uh, responsibles. And I think that all these struggles at different levels have implications, not only for the victims, obviously, and the perpetrators, but more broadly for the whole society. They have implications for what we understand by citizenship, by the nation state, and by democracy as well. So we are really uh, discussing legal struggles, which are also political struggles, obviously. And the third and last point, which I wanted to mention, and we will discuss it more, much more in the third session of the symposium, in the last session, is the question of inclusivity. These are struggles which are not only done on behalf of the survivors or on behalf of the victim's family, but they are done with them and often thanks to them at their initiatives and through their um, uh, determination, through their courage to uh, bring the truth uh, on the forefront front and to hold accountable uh, the perpetrators. And in all the cases we are going to discuss, we will see the involvement of uh, the survivors, of the victim's family, and this is something which uh, is also crucial in the uh, case uh, of Turkey, to uh, fight the system of impunity, to fight uh, the political system which maintains this uh, systemic uh, impunity relentlessly despite the threats, despite the pressure, despite uh, the trauma also. And uh, this is why we wanted to hear about these uh, different experiences, to exchange about these experiences and also, uh, again, to honor these uh, struggles. Uh, I am going now to introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, David Roberts. Uh, David Roberts is a senior associate solicitor in the international department at LIDE, a law firm in London. He specializes in international human rights and environmental claims against multinational companies and claims against the British government. And the case which he is going to uh, discuss today is a case he was himself personally involved in. That this is the Mau Mau claims. He represented with other lawyers Kenyan victims of colonial torture who alleged that they were subjected to torture and other forms of ill treatment at the hands of the British colonial administration in the 1950s uh, in Kenya. Thank you very much, uh, Robert, David, for being with us today, and uh, the floor is yours. I just wanted to remind all of our speakers that there is uh, simultaneous interpretation, so please uh, to try to speak uh, slow enough to allow uh, interpretation. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much for the invite and for the very kind um, invitation and introduction. Um, I know I have a habit of speaking too quickly, so I will try and go as slow as I can. Um, but if I do run away, um, please do give me a shout. Um, please also be warned that I have two young kittens somewhere in the house and I'm unable to shut my door. So at some stage I may be um, ambushed. Um, so please bear with me if that happens. Um, okay, so to start, I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully this will work. Um, I've got a message saying the host has disabled screen sharing. Is it possible to get that remedied so I can share my screen? There we go, thank you. Okay, so um, I think some of this early um, introduction has already kind of been dealt with, so I can go relatively quickly. Um, so briefly, for those of you who are unaware of what Lead A is, um, we are a London-based law firm um, with 
many traditional forms of legal practice that many of you will be aware of, you know, employment and the like. We also have a international department, as has already been touched on, where we specialize in claims typically either brought against British multinationals or the British government on behalf of individuals who have been harmed internationally. Um, I have been with the firm for over 10 years. I joined as a paralegal. So for those of you who are not in the legal profession, that is an unqualified junior lawyer. Um, and I have subsequently um, trained and qualified with the firm. Um, the case I'm going to talk to you about, as has already been said, is the Mau Mau claims. So um, this was a claim that I've worked on since the start of my career, all the way through its lifespan, um, with two senior lawyers that we have here at Lee Day, um, Martin Day, who is the founder of our law firm, and Daniel Leader, who is a, a partner at the law firm who I continue to work with to this day. So as has already been touched on, these claims um, arise out of the Kenya emergency. So that was a state of emergency that was declared in Kenya during the 1950s and lasted for a period of eight years. Um, during that period, the British authorities, alongside the British Army, um, created a very comprehensive system of um, detention, interrogation, um, a whole system and network of camps across what was central province in Kenya. And as you'll see on the slide here, it's considered that as many as 150,000 suspected members of the, the resistance, the struggle, were detained in those camps. Um, Caroline Elkins, who is a historian who's written about the emergency extensively, actually approximates that if you include the enforced villages, so this is where individuals were forced to live within villages that were surrounded by fencing and security guards, that number actually increases to over a million. So it was a very significant operation over a very prolonged period of time. And effectively what would happen is individuals would be captured, arrested, um, and then interrogated for information um, what was key to the British authorities and security services at this time was to force people into a confession. Um, and so severe mistreatment and torture um, was part of their way of extorting that. So the claims were brought on behalf of five lead claimants. So these um, are in Deacon Matua. So he is on the left of your screen um, and Paolo Enzili. Paolo and Ndiku are both members of the Kamba tribe in Kenya. Um, predominantly, the insurgency was focused on the Kikuyu tribe, but it did extend into other tribes in Kenya, particularly the Kamba. Um, the Kamba had a long history of working with the British military authorities. So when the British became aware that the Kamba were also involved in the insurgency, they were particularly aggressive with their stamping out of that within the Kamba. That led to some very severe um, instances of um, mistreatment. Both Ndiku and Paolo suffered castrations um, at the hands of the authorities. We then have Susan Ngondi and Jane Mara, um, both of whom were detained by the British authorities and very severely sexually abused. Um, they had a means of basically abusing people with with bottles, some with extremely hot water inside. And then the last individual we have on the left is Wambugu Nyengi. So Wambugu was actually held, he was arrested quite early on in the emergency and held almost throughout the entirety. Um, and he was involved in a very significant event which was covered internationally called the Holla Massacre. So this was an event where I think about a group of 11 or 12 detainees were taken from the detention camp they were given instructions of forced labor. And when they were refused, they were very severely beaten. I think 10 individuals were killed. Wambugu is the only survivor from that incident. And he only survived because they beat him unconscious and they believed he was dead. He woke up in the morgue um, and he thankfully survived and, and was able to join part of the cause in terms of seeking reparations. So briefly, in terms of the claims, the claims started in June 2009. 
um, the British government challenged those claims. Um, they challenged them on two points. The first was that there was no claim against the British government in law. Um, I wouldn't go too far into the technicalities because obviously we're dealing with multiple jurisdictions here and, and each country is going to have their own legal hurdles. But in a nutshell, the issue here is that the British government was effectively arguing that everything that happened in Kenya was done in right of the crown in Kenya, a different legal entity, that the British government was not involved in what had happened. It's um, a very technical legal argument. Um, that was the issue that we dealt with first in April 2011, and thankfully the courts found in our favour. The second issue um, was that the government raised the defence of limitation, which is what we're here to talk about today. Um, and so that issue came to light in 2012. Um, and again, thankfully, we were able to make our representations successfully and the court found in our favour. I should emphasise that in both of these instances, we are talking about preliminary hearings as opposed to a full trial. Um, in England, the um, burden is lower in a preliminary hearing. In a full trial, we need to argue our case on the balance of probabilities, whereas for these preliminary hearings, we the bar is lower. Um, essentially, we have to just evidence that our claim is arguable. So it's much easier to win at that early level as opposed to at a full trial. Um, we were very fortunate during the proceedings in that the cases uh, garnered a significant amount of media coverage. Um, this was not just from um, newspapers that we would consider perhaps traditional allies that would write about such issues. Um, here we have three front pages from the Times, which I think most people would consider to be, you know, a centre conservative establishment newspaper. Um, so it was quite something that it was picked up by the Times, and also other newspapers that traditionally lie more on the right that would be protecting the government from these allegations. Um, and these are this amount of attention is important, as was said earlier in the introduction. Whilst this is a legal claim, it was much broader than that. There were political issues at stake. Um, so the fact that the claims garnered a significant amount of attention was very important in putting pressure onto the British government. So following the success of the two preliminary hearings, um, with limitation being found in favour in 2012, um, we then moved our work into Kenya, where for the best part of a year, we travelled extensively around Kenya, interviewing other victims. I think in total, we interviewed roughly about 20,000 individuals, and we were able to accept instructions on behalf of just over 5,200. Um, and I will come back to this later, but this is important because as you'll see, we started the case with the five, and as we built the momentum and build the success, we've expanded that and built upon it. Um, after we had the first and second hearings, and whilst we were conducting our investigations, um, we were able to engage the British government in settlement negotiations. Um, I obviously can't say too much about that, um, but these were twin tracks whilst the British government was preparing its appeal against the hearings that had gone against it. And we were also preparing the cases to trial. So the litigation was progressing at court whilst we were simultaneously investigating the claims and building up the cohort larger, and at the same time, um, conducting negotiations with the British government. Um, and I'm, as some of you may already know, um, we were able to successfully resolve the claims. That was announced in June 2013. So having increased the size of the cohort, we were able to obtain compensation for over 5,000 victims um, these were individuals who, like our lead clients, had been 
detained and severely abused by the British authorities and security services in Kenya. The British government also made a statement of regret and funded the construction of a memorial park, well, sorry, a memorial in Uhuru Park in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, for those of you who don't know, Uhuru actually means freedom. So that's Freedom Park in Nairobi. Um, so that's some context of the legal case. And I suppose I'll return now to the main issue which everybody is here to, to discuss, which is limitation. So I won't go into too much detail again, because obviously we're talking about cross jurisdictions and, and the specifics will be very different. But in terms of the situation that we had for these cases, um, for cases such as these, limitation is three years. So you have three years from the date of the incident or the date that you have not sufficient knowledge to bring a claim to, to start this at court. Um, the court as well, though, does have a discretion in claims like these. So if you're unable to bring it within that three year period, you can argue your case before the court that it should exercise its discretion and allow the cases to proceed. Um, that's not the entire um, story, I suppose, in that, as you'll have seen, the limitation started in 1952 and went up to 1960. We were also dealing with a piece of legislation which provides for an absolute time bar, um, and that affects events that go, I think, midway into 1954. So we were unable to bring any claims that predated that. Um, it's an absolute statute bar, so we were unable to, to bring those forward. So we were only looking at incidents that happened when the Limitation Act 1980 came into force, that we could bring the claims under that regime. And again, we were relying on the discretion. So as you'll see from the slide, the British government were arguing that the claims should be dismissed on the basis that they were time barred because we hadn't brought them in time. Whereas we and the claimants um, accepted that they had not been started within that statutory deadline, but we sought to convince the court um, that due to the particular facts of these claimants, um, the reasons why they hadn't been able to bring their cases sooner um, and the fact that we argued a fair trial could still be held, the court should exercise its discretion and allow the claims to proceed. So during the proceedings, um, this is during the July 2012 hearing, the parties um, agreed that the primary issue before the court was this issue of whether or not a fair trial could still be held, this being some 50, 50 years plus since these events happened. Um, the British government unsurprisingly argued that a fair trial could not be held. Um, their argument was based on the fact that they said, you know, key witnesses were no longer available um, and that you know, the documentary evidence was insufficient. We, on the other hand, had argued that a fair trial was still available, um, pointing to the extensive archival evidence that existed, as well as the supportive evidence that we had got to support our clients' cases. So that was expert evidence on their injuries, um, supportive evidence in terms of contemporaneous documents, um, and any other witnesses who could give supporting evidence as to what had happened to those individuals. Um, on this, we were very lucky and that during the proceedings, it came to light that the British government had actually migrated um, significant tranche of documents out of Kenya on independence. Um, these had not been released into the public archives and they had been hidden away um, the government says by mistake um, in, a, in a secret archive and those documents came to light. Um, so we had the benefit of these, this additional information um, and that also gave more, I would say, um, more traction to the media attention that was coming forward at that time. So as I've already touched on, um, the court found in favour of our clients in July 2012, finding that a fair trial was still possible 
Um, and this was based on the cogency of the evidence and the documentation that had been put forward. Also, the availability of witnesses that were still alive to that date. Um, so that's a, a brief overview of the, the claims themselves. Um, obviously, they're, they're much more complicated um, than that, and we could probably spend all afternoon talking about the work that we did, um, but we don't have that that time. So I've tried to just give a as brief overview as I can to give you some context of, of how we got from the start of the case to the resolution. Um, and I will now try and just try and tease some kind of strategic and practical lessons out. Um, before I do that, I should also say, though, that um, during the introduction, it was touched upon kind of issues of international public law and their application to limitation periods. Um, I myself am a, a private law lawyer. I'm, I'm, that's not my area of expertise. Um, but during the July 2012 hearing, um, submissions on public international law and their impact on limitation in cases such as these were made um, by an NGO called Redress. Um, unfortunately, those arguments were not successful. Um, but if anybody is interested in those submissions uh, and the court's reasoning on its conclusions, um, I would suggest reading the judgment from the 2012 hearing. Um, moving now on to the lessons that we can draw from our experience of the Mau Mau claims. Um, number one, I would say it's incredibly important to be very careful with the cohort of clients that you are representing and the scope of the claims. Um, we are not the only case um, that was brought forward that arises from the Mau Mau um, from the Mama victims and the Kenya emergency. There was a follow on claim um, that was brought on behalf of over 40,000 clients. Um, that case went to a full trial and unfortunately lost with decisions being made in 2018. So there are clear, I would say, distinctions between the strategy that we employed and the strategy that those working on the other case employed. We were always very conscious of how much we were asking of the court to find in favour of our clients. I think with most lawyers, and I appreciate not everyone here will be a lawyer, um, the notion of obtaining a finding by the court that a fair trial is still possible 50 years plus after the event is a very big ask. We were conscious of how much we were asking the court. So we wanted to make it as easy as possible in that regard. Now, that meant some difficult decisions. Um, we would obviously want to help anybody who was mistreated during this period. But we had to be very conscious that if you're putting the case before the court, there is obviously going to be a very significant difference in the court's attitude between addressing the claim of an individual who's been very severely tortured and the claim of an individual who has been perhaps detained, detained unlawfully, they allege, or otherwise, um, but suffered either no physical violence um, or um, relatively low level physical violence. Um, so we were very careful and we made sure that when we put the lead cases forward, we were putting forward the strongest claims, those that would grab the court's attention. Um, and that is why the lead five clients were selected. Um, I think it's also important to consider the scope of the claims that you're bringing. The claims that we were bringing were limited to personal injuries and the injuries and consequential you know, injuries of that. Um, whereas the scope of the claims in the follow-up claims were much wider. Um, so they were looking at issues of, um, I think, financial losses, also the legality of whether or not someone was detained legally or otherwise. 
So those were much more complicated questions, both legally and evidentially, that they were putting to the court. Whereas by narrowing our cohort and the issues that we were putting forward, um, we were giving the court only the most significant and I suppose arguably easiest questions to wrestle with. Um, point number two is to work within the framework. Um, I would say that, you know, in these scenarios, you have two options. Um, one is simply to, to challenge the application of limitation full stop. Um, obviously, there is value in that strategy, but I think anyone pursuing it would recognize that um, completely challenging the disapplication will be a much bigger ask then working within the legal framework that exists, whilst obviously seeking to push it as far as you can, but recognizing you are working within that legal framework. Um, as I already touched upon, we did, I suppose, do simultaneous. We did seek to argue that the limitation with the help of redress shouldn't be applied. That part of the claim was lost. The successful elements of the claims were treating the claims as personal injury claims under the limitation framework and being very sure that we were ticking all of the right boxes to ensure that we met um, the thresholds that were required. Um, I think sometimes with claims that are as emotive as these, it can be easy to, to lose sight of the technicalities. Um, because there is that moral outrage these individuals should get a remedy. That is utterly understandable. Um, but it's also very important to not lose sight of the framework that you're working under. Um, I suppose building on what I've already said about trying to make things easier for the court, we were very careful on that front. You know, it was an important element for the claims for the court to exercise its discretion that we explained the reason for the delay. So we ensured that our client's witness evidence gave an account of why there had been a delay. Unfortunately, the other claims that followed did not. That was part of the reasoning why they were dismissed. Um, another important point was doing as much as we could to recognize the period of time and making trying, I suppose, to fill in the gaps. You know, we we don't have their individual detention records. We don't have their contemporaneous medical assessments, not that there probably would be any. So we had to do what we could to fill in those gaps. So we ensure that they were assessed by experts that could write reports that, you know, their accounts were consistent with their scarring, you know, trying to bolster their accounts. We also spoke with individuals who had been detained with them, individuals that could talk to what happened, support their accounts. Again, giving the court confidence about the cogency of the evidence, um, that this was not um, just a shot in the dark, that the evidence could be considered and challenged. Um, in addition to that, it was meticulously going through what evidence there was there in terms of the archival documentation. Um, and I suppose that brings me to the next point, which is about sharing a load. It's about recognizing again how difficult these cases are. Um, and I think there is that adage that, you know, um, sharing a problem obviously makes it easier to solve that problem. We were very fortunate in that we did not bring these claims on our own. We not only worked with a brilliant group of barristers um, who were able to you know, distill the huge amount of information and evidence to the court in a very digestible way. It was about everybody else that helped us. We worked with the Mau Mau War Veterans Association, um, who was um, critically important in organizing the veterans, um, getting that wider support base. We worked with, worked with the Kenya Human Rights Commission, who again, was critical in um, 
arranging and managing the clients, facilitating their travel from Kenya, um, facilitating their assessments of medical attention in Kenya. Um, also um, kind of reaching out to wider stakeholders and um, getting the message out there in terms of what was going on and shining that spotlight. Um, we walked, worked, sorry, with a group of historians. Um, I've mentioned Caroline, that's Caroline Elkins before. Um, there were two um, very well-respected academics who had previously written about the detention practices in Kenya during this period. That was Professor Caroline Elkins and Professor David Anderson. We also worked with a third academic, um, Dr. Hugh Bennett, who was a military historian. Um, they were not only able to act as our guides through the archival evidence, but we were fortunate enough to have witness statements submitted on their behalf where they were able to digest the significance of that information and communicate it to the court. Again, it was about making the, the court's job as easy as possible. Um, but I would say all of those organizations, so the Mamau War Veterans Association, the, the historians, um, the Kenya Human Rights Commission, they also had a very important role to play, um, not only in the litigation, but the, the broader um, effort, I think, which was critically important in terms of getting the story out there, um, in terms of getting that, that media attention. Um, you know, um, journalists aren't always that interested in talking to lawyers. Um, not everyone thinks particularly highly of us. Um, but having um, the victims there um, who could talk directly, having NGOs and historians who could get that message out there, I think was very important in terms of building that, that critical momentum um, within the media. And I would say that was very important in terms of reaching the settlement we did. Um, it also played a critical role, I think, within the proceedings um, in the another key distinction between the hearing that, that we did on limitation and the full trials of the following claims is that because of the weight of media interest in what was happening, the British government took the very unusual step of simply accepting our client's evidence. Um, you know, we, we suspect that they, they did not want the victims to be cross-examined in court. That would have led to further negative press. Um, so to avoid that, they accepted the client's evidence. Um, that was a very important point in our client's favor um, in terms of why a fair trial was still possible. The UK government didn't make that same um, acceptance in the follow-on case. Um, which didn't have the same amount of media scrutiny or attention. Um, and so the government there, the government lawyers were able to cross-examine the witnesses. There were evident issues over the consistency of their evidence. You know, it undermined their case for a, that a fair trial was still possible. Um, I suppose um, those are the broad points. I suppose the one point I would say, again, just referring back to the, the issue of strengthening the cohort, um, was that, you know, another very difficult decision we made was in terms of, you know, it was critically important to us that we were representing individuals who were still alive, people who could give their evidence to the court themselves. Um, we started off with the five lead clients um, who I spoke about earlier. Um, sadly, Susan and Gandhi passed away before she was able to give her evidence. Um, so of those cases that progressed, um, it was only Susan's who we were unsuccessful with. Um, and that was because she had passed away and she was not able to give her evidence to the court. You know, that was critically important to the court in terms of judging why a fair trial was still possible. Um, I appreciate that was a whistle-stop tour. Um, and because I'm sharing my screen, screen, I can't actually see how long I've spoken for. So um, apologies if I've either finished um, a bit too quick or if I have rumbled on for a bit too long. Um, but Thank I think you much, David. that uh, should do. Thank you. And I think uh, you raise a lot of important points. I mean, the question of reparations, which we just uh, started to touch upon in the morning, the lim 
what this kind of claims can bring, but also their important limitations. And I think this is something we can uh, discuss later on. But uh, I would like to give the floor now to Emilio Silva, uh, who is uh, in Madrid and is a journalist and the president of the Association for the Recovery of Historical Memory. This organization was founded in, the, in uh, 2000 with the aims of locating and identifying the victims of the repression during the Spanish Civil War and the Franco dictatorship. And since then, Emilio has headed this uh, association's project in Spain and he has called on the government for justice, particularly in the cases of people who were uh, forcibly disappeared during the Spanish repression and is the author of several books and co-editor of several uh, books uh, on the period of Franco, on these questions, and also on memory policies. Thank you very much, Emilio, for uh, being with us today. Maybe some of you had the opportunity to watch uh, The Silence of Others, which we screened this week and which actually already introduced uh, this discussion. So we are looking forward to uh, listening to you. Thank you, Emilio. Thank you for the invitation. My name is Emilio Silva. I am the grandson of a missing person during the the Spanish dictatorship from 1939 to 1975. During a lot of, of years, I listened in Spain talking about our transition is a perfect transition. We resolve the recovery of democracy with no blood, no, with no conflicts. All my all my life, listen this question. I study political science in the principal university in Madrid, and all my teachers talk about. The Spanish transition is an example for all the world. All the big countries have to come here to copy our transition, to leave quite the past, <coughs> including in, in 2006, a uh, representation of the Truth Commission of South Korea came to Spain to know if they have to choose the Spanish model of impunity or, or they have to resolve the questions about violations of human rights. No? In, in Latin America, when a uh, uh, regime break down with problems with human rights violations, uh, an important Spanish foundation go there with a very big exhibition about the Spanish transition. You have to choose the Spanish way and you have to leave the past and to grow economically. You no, know, it's the Spanish model, more or less. In 2000, I am journalist. I, I was writing a novel about the history of not of my family, but in the place of my family were living in the nor northwest of Spain. And I found uh, a friend of my father one day and he told me, I know the place of the grave of your grandfather. And then I asked, is too far? Arsenio, this man said, not 10 kilometers. And then I, I was there. I found my father, I am in the grave of your father, and I ask uh, in my mind a lot of questions, no? And I wrote an article in a Spanish newspaper with the title, mm, my grandfather also was a missing. Because in Spain, we never use the word missing, no? We have a, an euphemistic word, it's a paseado, it's a person who go to work and never back again. It's an euphemistic word to hide the crime. And, and I wrote this article because in the 1998, the Spanish justice detained Pinochet in London and the Spanish justice uh, start trials about uh, dictatorships so far from Spain, no? Argentina, Chile, Guatemala, Rwanda, all the problems so far from Spain have the possibility to to have an open door in the Spanish justice. This is uh, the activity of my Congress, my parliament, the Spanish parliament, about the question of the victims of the Franco's regime uh, from the end of the, of the dictatorship to the year uh, 2015. No? 
in the left side, we can see a, a, a country in white, no, with no memory any activity about the victims, no? We are talking about thousands of missing persons, more than 100,000. Uh, we have more than 2,000 mass graves in all the country, the, the country in the peninsula and in the islands. We have a lot of people missing and my parliament never talk about this question, no? They have a special commission during the transition about the missing Spaniards in the Latin America dictators, principally in Argentina and Chile, but they never want to talk about the question of the of the missing persons of our dictators. We export memory and import oblivion, more or less. No? When my, the grave, the mass grave of my grandfather was opened by a group of archaeologists and forensic doctors, was the first intervention with technical support and DNA tests. My grandfather is the first victim of the Franco's regime, the Spanish dictatorship, identified by the DNA test. At this moment, I only want to resolve a family problem. I want to put the bones of my grandfather with the bones of my grandmother. She died two years before I found the grave. And But during the exhumation, a group of relatives of different places of the Northwest of Spain arrived there and say, I, I am looking for my brother, I am looking for my father, I am looking for my grandmother. And then we decide to create an association to help these people in this area, because then we don't know nothing about the, the big name of missing persons in Spain. We don't have information, we don't have historical researches, the academy, the Spanish academy look to another place, they don't want to so to the Spanish society. The, the results of the repression of the dictatorship because we have a very long dictatorship and we have an elite culturally, economically, politically, so uh, academically are children of the Franco regime of the dictatorship because the dictatorship was very long, 40 years. They create the elite for the transition during the 50s, 60s, 70s in the Spanish university there are more or less only children of the winners of the war, children of the Franco's regime, you know? and then in different political parties, but they manage the transition to democracy, the children of the regime, and they build uh, an amnesty law in the Spanish parliament in 1977, uh, with the support of the principal left political parties, with, opposite or forbidden party during the dictatorship. They decide to support the amnesty. During a lot of years, the Spanish politicians say it's an, this amnesty law is for the victims of the Spanish uh, dictatorship. But a victim of the Spanish dictatorship in democracy didn't need an amnesty law because they are not criminals. The people who need and amnesty law are the perpetrators. No? And when we start to open grace and to go to the courts, the Spanish courts, to talk about we have found uh, bones with violent signals in a mass grave, uh, all the courts say, no, no, we have an amnesty law. We cannot uh, trial these uh, uh, violations of human rights. I'm sorry. And then we, we understand that the amnesty law, like in the most of the countries, is an auto-amnesty law. When we start to open the grace, we have to decide what happens, no? We can wait for the justice or we have to look for the missings, no? It's an, an ethical or moral decision in our group. And we decide we cannot wait for the justice because the justice is looking to another place and the Spanish justice don't want to know not, nothing about these crimes, no? And by other way, we, we know very old people, 80s or 90s, looking for parents or husbands or brothers, and we cannot wait. And then we start to open the mass graves, no? In 
23 years, we opened more than 200 mass graves in different parts of Spain. At this moment, we are in Galicia, in the northwest of Spain, opening a mass grave with four bodies. Appears um, uh, yesterday morning. We don't have any support of the Spanish government. We only have uh, volunteers from more than 20 countries come here to help us. And we start to open the grace because we want to create a mirror for the Spanish society. No? At the beginning, we decide what happens with the pictures of the of the bones. No, could be public pictures or have to be private pictures and pictures for the reports of the archaeologists and forensic doctors. But we decide to show the horror of the grave. No, and a, a mass grave is like a mouth. And the process of to recover the memory is a conversation. At the beginning, I start to talk with many fear the relatives, and then also start to talk the archaeologists and the forensic doctors and the journalists and the neighbors of the small villages with the graves. And then we are building a polyphonic conversation in the Spanish society. The courts never come to the conversation where in 2008, the same judge who detained Pinochet in London, Martisar Garzot, tried to open a juridical process in Spain against the Franco's crimes. And now he's not a judge. He was a criminal because he tried to trial the Franco's regime. No? It's, the, it's the, the power of the impunity in Spain. No? And we have two principal causes. One of them is looking for the missings and the other one have to to be or have a relation with the education. No? In this, uh, you are watching a picture of some uh, scholar books. One of them say is for, uh, the new scholar books will say that the coup d'etat in 1936 was a coup d'etat. This new is from two years ago. And during 45 years, the scholar books are hiding the history or taking it's not a coup d'etat, it's uh, a, an order movement of the Spanish uh, military people to create order. During a lot of years, 40 years of demo in democracy, we have this information to, to teach the new citizens. No? Or in the book, uh, Downside, in the, in the left, are a scholar books talking about one of the most important poets in Spain. In the left, totally, is Federico García Lorca, is the most important poet of the 20th century in Spain. He's still missing. And the, the, the scholar books say he was in Granada, where he lives the, his last moments. No, no. It's, it's, for me, it's impressive. No? He lives his last moments. No, he died his last moment because so a group of fascist people killed him, no? And Antonio Machado had to cross the Pyrenees to France at the end of the war. He died some days after. And the scholar books say he moved with his family to France, no? Only, only, because they are hiding all the time the repression, no? We have a political, we have a very uh, important country producing ignorance producing ignorance, no? all the time producing ignorance. And when we open the graves, we start to look for uh, to the past through the, through the grave, no? through the idea of the crimes. We start to create the idea of the crimes. No? And we start to show the horror of the poems, the ballads, the objects, glasses, or, or pens, or coins or small pieces of paper eh, a lot of years after with the bones, no? And we start to talk to the Spanish society this question. And I think we broke the silence of our parliament, of our institution, of our academics, of uh, a country eh, dominated by the Franco's elite today, no? Today, I live in the autonomous community of Madrid. We have five important universities. We don't have 
our research about the repression of Franco in the autonomous community in Madrid in the year 2023. They prefer to talk about another questions. They prefer to touch this question of the violations of human rights. No? And we are trying to break this silence and to put this question in the justice, Spanish justice. In 2010, we went to the Argentine justice. The only juridical process in the world about the Franco's crimes is in, in the Argentinian justice. We opened uh, the, the process in 2010 because the Spanish courts don't want to open the door for the Franco's victims. This process is open from near 13 years ago, very slow, but it's the only court in the world uh, taking information, taking testimonies of the victims, and perhaps the most important archive about the Francos and the Spanish uh, crimes are in Argentina, in this court, in this Argentine court. We want to say if my country is the winner of the international justice, no, because Spain uh, opened juridical processes about a lot of dictatorship and problems of human rights so far in Spain. What happens if we are going to another country and this country say to the Spanish uh, state, I start to trial your crimes, no? Because you defend the universal justice. And at the first moment, the Spanish institution start to broke the process of Argentina. They don't listen to the court, they don't help, they put a lot of problems, they put a lot of lies, and we have a lot of problems with the process, but it's the only process in Spain. Still today, for example, we have in the right up the picture, we have uh, this Arco de la Victoria, it's a monument who celebrate the victory of Franco, Hitler, and Mussolini. The first fascist victory in Europe was here in Spain, the beginning of the Second World War. And still today, we have this monument. This monument also is celebrating the crime of my grandfather, the crime of all the missions, the 300 concentration camps. One concentration camp is specifically for homosexual people. The vacuums of poliomyelit is only for the children of the winners of the war. We are living like in an upper head during the Franco's regime. And still today, my country is celebrating with this monument, monument the victory of the perpetrations of human rights, of violations of human rights. This monument is very near of the official residence of the Spanish, the president of the Spanish government, all the Spanish president from 1977 to today go through the mon near the behind the monument to the thing, to the parliament the spanish parliament any of them say i cannot support a monument celebrating the fascist victory in spain no but we still today are a very happy country a very noisy country a very sunny country what we are a very uh, a very sad country for the victims because I have to walk near this monument in my in my city in Madrid. No? Uh, when we open, start to open the graves, we start to know some things happen before we we start to open the graves. You know, after the dictatorship, a group of relatives in Spain start to look for the missing, with no archaeology doctors, with no forensic doctors, only with the love, their hands, and take all the bones and put all the bones in the cemetery. It start a move, a movement, a social movement to get justice for the victims. But in 1981, we have a coup d'etat, another coup d'etat, in 23, 1981, and all the people looking for mission stopped and left the graves in silence because they have a lot of fear. 40 years of dictatorship is a very big production of fear. Still today, we go to small villages and there are people saying, I don't know nothing. And they were in the place of the crime, but they prefer to talk about it. Still today, because the, the uh, Aussians, uh, sorry with my English, when the government don't do nothing, do nothing, the fear have 
a very, very long life. When their culture don't have a very important film about the perpetration, the violations of human rights in Spain, they feel have a very, very, very long life. When the parliament don't talk about this question, they feel have a very, very, very long life. And one of our problems are still today the fear. And the history is very uh, important to learn. In 18 July, 1936, Spain have a coup d'etat, a fascist coup d'etat. And millions of people go to the streets to defend democracy. In 1981, we have another coup d'etat. Nobody go to the streets to defend democracy because we learn the lesson of the fear and we prefer to stay at home waiting what happens. In 50 years, we learn to let the coup d'etat growing. No, my grandfather was a person who, a civilian, but he opposite to the coup d'etat in 1936 and is the reason he was killed. No? And during the exhumations, I start to know what happens with the parents during the 70s and the grandchildren looking for the grandparents. No? One day I know this picture. In the left side, you can see a picture of Castellao. He's a, a very intellectual person from Galicia. He was died in Buenos Aires, in Argentina in exile in 1960. And this, uh, a miner arrived to the exhumation of one grave and take me this poster. No? This poster was painted in the year 1937 during the strong repression of civilians, Republican civilians in the, in the Galicia region. No? And these men, made this a uh, picture in the right side of the picture so far you can see crutches they are far from a cemetery and they are putting civilian bodies dead bodies in a grave no like the graves we are looking for today we not we never look for graves from the war we are looking for graves of civilians killed by the fascist people and there is a sentence in the downside of the picture and the sentence says they don't bury bodies, they bury seeds. And when I saw this picture 20 years ago, it was very, very emotional for me, very impressive, no? Because we are taking the result of the seeds. Uh, the, human, the humans are very stupid when we write the human rights after the biggest violations of human rights and not before. But the damage of these people have to create a, a culture of human rights in Spain. No? In 10 years ago, Amnesty, International Amnesty make a report about the principal, the 50 principal countries in Europe Union about the education in human rights. And this, Spain is the last, and it's not a casualty, it's a political decision. Because we want to create as a, politica, a political culture with no problems with the past, with no problem with the art of victory, with no problem with impunity. No? And the seeds in the graves have uh, to show the Spanish society what happens and have to be a lesson for us to create a better culture of human rights. No? Now many people in Spain in 23 years have seen exhumations. And I think it's very important. Because I, I said, it's a mirror. I am the result of these uh, mass graves. My country is the result of this violence. And I have the responsibility to do something. No? And I want to finish with this, uh, with this another picture of Castellar from the 1937 year. No? My father, I was, I, I grew with, uh, my father, with nine years old, have to leave the school because the fascist people killed his father, has, have to leave the school and never back again. No? My education is in contact with the trauma completely. No, Sometimes the academic people used to talk about post-memoria. I have 
57 years old. I am not supposed to be mourning. I grow with the trauma near, the trauma talking with me, the trauma talking about my grandfather and saying to me, you cannot talk about this question out of home, no? And then I think it's very important because this memory is still alive. It's part of my emotions. My, uh, my life is completely mm, mixed with this memory. No? And for me, this picture is also very important. It's, oh, and also a picture of Catelao, this deaf man with the two children looking at the deaf man. No? And there is a sentence in the downside of the picture who said, the last lesson of the teacher. And the last lesson of the teacher is to solve his crime, his death, no? And for us, it's very important when we open a grave and we saw the pictures of the people, we are creating a human right teachers, no? Because they are talking through the bones, through the holes of the ballots, through the objects, through the sad life of the relatives talking near the grave during the exhumation. No? And I think it's very important to put in the public space these teachers, men and women, defending the first democracy in Spain you know, during the 30s. The academic people used to say in Spain after the Franco's regime, after the dictatorship, we have the transition to democracy. No, we have the recovery of our democracy. We made a transition to democracy in the 30s. We have general elections with universal suffrage, male and female, in the 19 November, 1933. No, and we need to learn the history of these people because it's the possibility to have a better country. And it's part of the justice we can create without court justice, no? It's a social justice, it's an educational justice, it's a citizen justice, no? Because our courts don't want to talk about this question. When I was teen, my grand, my father used to tell me, I tried to translate this, this expression. If you leave uh, the people who live with dreams, die by the reality, no? Then, my father is giving me an order. You cannot dream because when your grandfather dreamed, they was killed and you have to live your dreams. And, it, and it's a very sad sentence, but the new generations have the responsibility to break these kind of orders, you know, to break the silence. And the grandchildren, and now we have a... Mm, uh, great grandchildren in the exhumations today in Galicia have the responsibility to break this legacy to the new generations, no? Because this problem is too long, too long. We can, for example, we have the example of the US. They have a civil war 80 years after the Spanish Civil War, and still today they are they have conflicts, political conflicts, because they no. don't resolve have a good resolution of the war, no? And in the Virginia states, some months ago, they have a new law to destroy a, a, a, a sculpture of the slavers, no? And, and I, I think we also have to think that we have to resolve this question because we cannot uh, give this legacy to the new generation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emilio. Sorry for uh, interrupting uh, you. Unfortunately, we have little time, but again, I mean, a lot to discuss and also I think a lot of things which uh, echoed the question of uh, disappeared in Turkey uh, as well. Um, I would like to introduce our last speaker for this session, Marcela Perelman. Uh, thank you for being with us. She is the director of the research department of the Center for Legal and Social Studies in Buenos Aires, Argentina. This is a human rights organization which was founded in 1979 during the last military dictatorship and which promotes the protections of human rights uh, and their effective exercise, justice and social inclusion. 
and she is also affiliated with the political and legal anthropology department at the University of Buenos Aires. Thank you very much for being with us, uh, Marcela, and the floor is yours. Hello, everyone, and thank you for, for the invitation and the interest in, in our Argentinian case, our experience. I hope it will be a contribution to the, I don't know, the international fight for human rights, especially in Turkey. And thank you also, my fellow panelists, Emilio and David, for your insightful presentations. I have to say that I am not a lawyer, and I make this explicit because I am going to address eminently legal issues, but from a more social historical point of view. I also want to say that this presentation was uh, collectively produced and based on previous sales uh, uh, documents that you can find in our website. So I'm going to try to address the following questions. What is the experience of Argentina and the Inter-American Court regarding the statute of limitations and amnesty laws? Why it was established that they should not apply to the gross violations of human rights and crimes against humanity that took place in Argentina between 1976 and 1983? As I will try to address the Inter-American human rights system, played a prominent role in the fight against impunity in the region and specifically, especially in Argentina. Also, transnational jurisdictions played a role, as Emilio already mentioned, there were cross processes between Spain and Argentina at different stages. Under international law, as you Already no states are obligated to investigate and punish human rights violations. However, the story of how these international or these principles of international law became applicable in Argentina in the context of widespread impunity requires telling our winding story of memory, truth, and justice. But before focusing in Argentina, uh, I think we can differ differentiate two major stages of the role of the inter-American system in these issues. Initially, the inter-American human rights system documented right violations and endorsed victims' claims through country reports, producing in loco visit, as happened in my country on, in 1979 with the inter-American report on the case of Argentina, that ultimately informed the world about uh, the situation. My organization, CELS, was founded in that context of the preparation of that visit, selecting the cases, uh, filing testimonies. Then the other stage that we can differentiate took place when the individual petition system developed. The inter-American system began shaping key principles for justice, truth, and reparations in cases of widespread human rights violation. It challenged amnesty laws, as the case of Argentina shows. So now we can focus on the Argentinian case. The accountability process undergone by Argentina over the last 40 years, there's uh, from 1983, Till nowadays is a response to the crimes committed by the last and cruelest dictatorship experienced by my country. The uh, I, I don't know if, if you are all familiar with the kind of dictatorship we, we had in the 70s. The, the military took power on March 24th of 1976, initiating a dictatorship with distinct characteristics all three branches of the armed forces jointly constituting a government uh, called the Junta. The exceptional legislation coexisted with parallel secret norms that regulated repressive operations, clandestine. The repression was massive. There was uh, kidnapping, enforced disappearances, uh, torture. As you may know, uh, detainees were in a high number enforced disappeared. It later became known that disappearances 
was a systematic state-driven policy that consisted of killing the victims and hiding or destroying the bodies. There was a particular feature of the Argentine repression strategy that was that uh, pregnant women were often kept alive for the purpose of giving birth upon which their newborn, newborn babies were taken by other families, changing and hiding their real, real identity. This is the struggle of the abuelas de Plaza de Mayo, grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo. It is important to take into account this different, differentiated type of crime, since, as we will see, the arguments around its particularity configured one of the main strategies to oppose impunity laws. The military self-amnesty law in 1983, when the dictatorship was uh, coming to an end, um, intended to cover crimes was contested by Congress and the Supreme Court leading to justice for these uh, severe human rights violations in 1984, culminating in the um, well-known Junta's trial of 1985. You, you can watch the film of uh, last year, 1985 is the name of the film that, that focuses in this specific trial. The justice of, obtained after the Junta trial and the spread of the investigations all over the country caused the military's fear of widespread trials and led to several mil, uh, military revolts that presented a serious threat to democracy in the first years of the transitional process. In short, these events prompted the government to change course and develop strategies to limit the trials. So there were two main decisions to limit the trial. First, the full stop law enacted on December 23 of 1986 established a 60 day period for resuming all claims against the military before civil courts. This is full stop. Uh, but contrary to what was expected, uh, the reduction of the crimes of the claims the amnesty law initiated what we call the frenetic activity of the federal courts. Within that short period of time, two months, hundreds of claims, claims were presented throughout the entire country. And at the end, when full stop came, the number of cases incurred had tripled. But tensions between the government and the military increased also the revolts and after several military actions and, and revolts, then President Alfonsín submitted to Congress the new obedience law, which was approved in 1987. The new obedience principle was to concentrate responsibility only in the highest hierarchies that, and that those subordinated obeyed orders and were considered free of responsibility. The direct effect of these two impunity amnesty, we call this uh, full stop and de obedience uh, impunity laws. Uh, as an effect, there was the armed prosecution of uh, 431 defendants and the definitive stop to most of ongoing investigations. Shortly after taking office, the next president, Menem, in 1990, issued presidential pardons that benefited all military who had been convicted of human rights violations. The presidential pardons marked the beginning of a long period of impunity. There was an important reaction from human rights organizations such as mine and other social movements all over the country who took to the street in protest. However, this blow did not prevent, well, that did not prevent us from seeking out other strategies for fulfilling our goals in the struggle for accountability. I will not address these other strategies in detail, but in this impunity context, it was possible to advance in terms of truth and reparation. 
uh, with the turn of the century, with the new century, there was kind of a wave of accountability that began to grow in Latin America. So the idea that there were no national, international, nor ethical, nor legal, or political grounds for sustaining impunity laws in Argentina gradually took root in different sectors of society and political agreements. A favorable international context to prosecute these grave offenses, a weakened military after the 90s, high protagonist of state actors, and the role of human rights organizations facilitated the onset of new era of trials, as I will try to uh, explain. And this, as we will see, uh, meant that the, the inter-American system had a great influence. So I have to, to explain the um, Caso Simon, the Simon case that marked the onset of this uh, new phase of criminal justice that continues to, to nowadays, to our days. It started with a complaint filed by Abuelas de Plaza de Mayo, the grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo and Cells. These uh, organizations, grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo, are the grandmothers of those babies kidnapped in the 70s. And uh, this case was filed in the year 2000. The judiciary was already investigating the 1978 abduction of uh, Claudia Poblete that was eight months old at the time. Since this specific kind of crime was kept out originally outside of the scope of national uh, of uh, amnesty laws. So there, there was an opportunity because of this uh, specific particularity of this crime. So the, the lawyers at cells saw that there was an opportunity to show the, the paradoxical effect of the amnesty laws. In one hand, the crime of the children abduction could be investigated while the disappearances of, of the parents which enabled the kidnapping of the child could not. This way of reasoning on the repression chain was the human rights organization's main argument, both cells and, and abuelas, to seek for the annulment of the laws. In its first instance, uh, in this case in 2001, the federal judge used international human rights statements to sustain that states must prosecute serious human rights violations and, and subsequently charge two former police officers with the crimes. The Federal Chamber of Appeals, while confirming the ruling, sustained that, and I'm quoting, in the current context of constitutional development of human rights, repealing and declaring these laws, full stop and due obedience, and constitutional is not an alternative, it's a duty. This was the first time the judiciary used international human rights arguments to declare the nullity of amnesty laws. The increased uh, prominence of international human rights law in legal education and practice can be attributed to the 1994 constitutional reform in Argentina, which elevated international human rights treaties and led to their incorporation into law curricula. Um, I said elevated international human rights treaties because they have the same uh, legal status as the constitution. The National Congress also played a key role on the annulment of the amnesty laws, and uh, the then president, uh, Nestor Kirchner, stated he would support the Congress decision and at the same time to the debate, he signed a decree which ratified the Convention on the Non-Applicability of Statutory Limitations to War Crimes and Crimes Against Humanity. The House of Representatives approved the law that gave constitutional hierarchy of the convention in August, August 2003. 
However, and this is very important, it is considered that this convention was enforced at the time of at, at the time they even secured in the 70s, since it already integrated the general framework of international law. This is an important uh, point as to why this is not a case of retroactive application of the criminal law. And this was stated also by the Supreme Court. Then it also, uh, the House of Representatives approved the law which nullified the amnesty laws. This showed that Congress was also leaning in favor of accountability and particularly in favor of reactivating criminal justice. The Supreme Court also uh, showed signs in favor of challenging the amnesty laws after that, and while appeal on Simon case, as I just said, uh, the, the appeal was still pending, but in 2004, it ruled in the Arancibia Clavel extradition case to, to Chile that crimes against humanity were not subject to statutes of limitation. In 2005, also in the framework of the same Simon case, the Supreme Court found that the impunity laws were contrary to international human rights law. In light of the president of the Inter-American Court in the Barrios Altos case, that is a very important reference, uh, the case of Barrios Altos. And then Argentina Supreme Court took Barrios Altos arguments on the state's obligations to investigate and sanction grave human rights violations and the impossibility of granting amnesty in favor of the perpetrators of crimes against humanity. Another contribution of the Inter-American system was the report 2892, in which the commission resolved the complaints made by the victims who argued the violation of the right to judicial protection by the action of the amnesty law. In that report, the commission concluded that their application was incompatible with the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man and the American Convention on Human Rights and recommended the Argentine government to adopt measures to clarify and find the responsibility responsible for the crimes committed during the dictatorship. And the Supreme Court used these same arguments in uh, the Simon ruling. Thus, uh, the combination of national and international political and legal strategizing pursued by human rights organizations and clear will from some relevant state actors led eventually to the reopening of trials against perpetrators. This new stage of criminal accountability for past human rights violations has given some important results Trials have grown in scope as well as in numbers. Roughly the numbers uh, at, at this moment is uh, 319 trials already had a sentence from the historical Shunta trial till now. Um, in total, 1,146 people were convicted and there were 253 acquittals in almost, almost the entire country with the exception of two provinces. The case is advanced. You know, time is running out because of biological reasons. And today there are 14 oral debates taking place in seven provinces. Of the 240 defendants, who were brought to trial, 185 are still under debate. The rest already died, 37, or were removed due to disability, 18 of them, and will not be tried for the crimes of which they were accused, they are accused. Um, Argentinian, so Argentinian path towards accountability has been far from linear. The actions for and backwards were performed by the different governments in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s until the process reached a point of uh, a point of convergence between state will and civil society claims in 2003. 
the con the constant in this uh, changeable process through time has been the struggle of the relatives and the human rights organizations uh, among other civil society actors. I have to say, though, especially in the current political context of my country, that there is a lim there always has been a limited society sector uh, that rejected opposite the accountability measures. Now uh, they have a growing political representation with uh, significant chances of winning the election this year. So we are under alert uh, in this context. Well, the, the accomplishments I, I tried to, to describe are the results of the combination of many different elements. We can list some of them, uh, strong uh, human rights tradition and human rights organization, executives who support human rights, governments, a significant number of uh, judges willing to prosecute, a certain important uh, sensitivity to international human rights law and to regional development, specifically the the inter-American inter system, human rights system, also uh, with effective uh, memory policies. Uh, together, all together, these elements have led to the design of many uh, significant pro-accountability measures. As a balance, we can say that uh, Argentina's state has acknowledged the military responsibility in the crimes. Uh, this process still presents challenges. Maybe some cases will not face trial, but uh, although there there are certain obstacles, uh, we understand that the process is mostly consolidated after more than forty years of of struggle because this uh, started uh, in the seventies uh, during the repression. And we are still working in, in this process. So thank you all for your attention. Okay, so I think there's a first question there. Merhaba. Benim ilk sorum David'e. Ee, belki biraz detay gibi görünebilir ama bu tür mağduriyetlerin e, genellikle yoksul e, ve çok dar gelirli insanlar üzerinde e, söz konusu olduğunu da düşünerek sormak istiyorum. E, Mao Mao davasının e, hem araştırma, o yoğun araştırma ve o, ihtimal o dayanışma sürecindeki finansmanı nasıl oldu? E, e, bu konuda bir bilgi rica edeceğim. Emilio'ya da e, kendi ülke yasalarını e, sınırlamalarını aşarak Arjantin'den dava açma gibi e, muhteşem esinlendirici e, hareketini ve yürüttüğü mücadeleyi saygıyla şey yapıyorum, dedenin ruhunu gönendirdiğine inanıyorum. Gracias, brother. Evet. <gülüyor> David, would you like to uh, answer about the question of funding such claims and how all this research was funded? Sorry, I can't. I didn't hear a translation of the question. So okay. I, uh, yeah, OK. I so I will translate the question then. Okay. Uh, the question was about uh, the Mao Mao claims and the fact that, uh, obviously, uh, the victims or their relatives often belong to uh, the poorest uh, categories of society and uh, the question was about how you found such claims I mean this huge research and travels which were uh, done how did it did you find the resources or the oh. victims <laughs> find the resources sure um, okay well the the work without getting too stuck into um, our business model um, the work was done on a no win no fee basis 
So effectively, um, Lee Day carried the risk and funded the cases. So, um, you know, we didn't ask our clients to pay as we did the work. Um, we carried all the risk. We funded the case ourselves. Um, and we do that through, um, you know, the fact that we do, we, we don't just do the human rights work. We were able to spread the risk of the human rights work, which is typically conducted on a, a no win, no fee basis. Um, by you know, bringing in funds from other areas of the firm's work, um, you know, clinical negligence cases, personal injury cases, employment cases, and the like. Um, but ultimately, um, it was the firm that funded funded the work. If that answers your question. Çok teşekkür ederim. Sunumlar için çok teşekkürler. Ee, Marcelo ve Emilio'ya bir soru sormak istiyordum. İki farklı e Ülke deneyimi dinledik. Birinde ceza adaletinin e, insanlar karşı suçlarla, darbe suçlarıyla yüzleşmede aktif olarak yargısal aktivizmin etkin olduğu. Diğerinde ise e, kurumsal yüzleşmenin olmadığı ve ceza adaletinin e, yıllar boyunca, on yıllar boyunca e, aslında bu tartışmaya hiç katılmadığı. Emilio çok e, çarpıcı bir şey söyledi. Korkunun çok uzun bir... E, yaşam aslında ömrü var ve kurumsal yüzleşmenin olmaması da bunu besleyen bir şey. Bunun olmadığı yerde bu korkuyu kırmak için yani kurumsal yüzleşmenin olmadığı yerde korkuyu kırmak için ne gibi tabandan e, örgütlenen e, etkili mücadele e, yöntemleri e, gösterebilir bize? E, bahsetti e, toplum mezarlarının açılması. Bunun dışında toplumsal tartışmada başka e, ne tür e, şeyler yüzeye çıkıyor. Marsalya'ya da şunu sormak istiyorum kısaca. E, i̇nsanlığa karşı suçların e, yargılandığı ve bugüne kadar gelen bu uzun süreçte devlet, yani doğrudan devlet e, aktörlerinin yani kamu e, görevlileri dışında işte örneğin doktorların e, işte hukuk aykırı, yani işkenceye e, işkenceye onay veren doktorların ya da e, din adamlarının ya da darbe suçlarının, insanlığa karşı suçlarının sosyoekonomik aktörlerinin yargılanması ile ilgili biraz daha bunlarla ilgili hesap verebilirlik ne aşamada bununla ilgili biraz daha bilgi verebilirse teşekkür ederim. Emilio would you, would you like to start Emilio did, did you get the question yeah okay. Okay. I think the fear is the fear is a tool for the perpetrators, no? It's a very benefit tool because if you create the silence in the victims you are Again, the winner of the conflict. No, uh, we think I have a teacher. The, my best teacher used to say that a revolution is a great conversation, and we only have the possibility to create this conversation. We don't have power for anything more. No, but uh, it's very, very difficult because, for example, some cases, some issues of Spain arrive to the European Court of Human Rights. And the court say to the victims, I, do, I don't accept the, your question because you left to pass a lot of time. And they closed the question in the Court of Human Rights, European Court of Human Rights. And I think the court have to talk with the Spanish government, not with the victims. <laughs> the victims have fear. If I have monuments celebrating the victory of Franco, Hitler, and Mussolini is still today in the Spanish streets. How can I broke the field? No. How can I go to the Spanish institution to say I am a victim of the Franco's regime if we have a lot of names of streets, monuments, uh, ships of the Spanish army, uh, a, a lot of uh, public spaces celebrating the dictatorship? No. Where is the confidence for the victims to say to our institution, democratic institution, I don't, I, I, I need to broke my fear. No, it, the Spanish problem is a problem of social structure. It's not a problem of political party. It's before the, the political system. It's, a, it's our social structure. In the village of my grandfather, the principal people with more properties and local power is the are the children of the gunners of the fascist party in a lot of 
the Spanish villages, it's the same. How can I broke my fear if the people who killed my grandfather have the local power, no? Have the influence. How can I broke this, uh, this relation, no? This structure. And politics have to make the change. The government have the responsibility to make the change. But we have a new, um, a new memory law in, in our parliament in, in the, last, the past year, in 2022, the democratic memory law. This law, don't say, this law has 148 times the word victim and zero times the word perpetrator. And it's a left a coalition of political parties in the government. And they did this law, this impunity law. They don't talk about the Spanish Catholic Church. They don't talk about the political slave for the principal Spanish companies today. They start to make money with political slaves until 1967. 80, 30, sorry, 30 years after the war, they use political slaves still today in Spain. And my government don't want problems with these people. No, this government, the government before this government and the government before this government. And we have to create this conversation in, in a small part of our life. No? Uh, thank you, Emilio. Sorry to interrupt thank you. you. We, are, we have a little time. Sorry, sorry thank I'm you. really sorry. Uh, Marcela, would you like to answer? And we'll end with this answer, unfortunately, not to get late with the program. Marcela. If I am, thank you for the question. If I understood properly, I was asked about uh, civic responsibility and how is this addressed in, in Argentina? Is that correct? Yeah, this is correct. Okay. This is a huge conversation in Argentina from the very beginning of uh, democracy. Uh, maybe uh, I can roughly describe it first as the how you frame and comprehend the dictatorship logics and rationality, which came first, the the economical rationality of the neoliberal model imposed by the dictatorship or the uh, political. Uh, objectives of uh, surprising um, these the political organizations of that moment. So, uh, both things were part of the process, and from the very beginning, uh, the participation and involvement of uh, doctors, uh, corporations, um, ecclesiastic. Um, I am uh, ecclesiastic. Uh, members, members of, of the Iglesia, were part of the repression, were involved in uh, crimes against humanity, were part of the torture, uh, were aware and participating of what happened. Uh, this is uh, reported in the, you may know, Nunca Más report of the CONADEP, which that was the first uh, Truth Commission uh, first uh, World Truth Commission, and these things are already reported there, reported there in 1984. Uh, but uh, these sectors uh, kept factual uh, important power till, till our day, so it's much more difficult uh, to build evidence and to have the support and the will of executive will and the judiciary will to uh, to to punish uh, these sectors, and it's more difficult also to build uh, strong evidence in some cases. Um, having said this, several trials have uh, had sentence uh, with some difficulties because, for instance. Um, for for punishing uh, the responsibility of corporate actors in uh, human rights violations, sometimes you uh, 
can accuse only uh, middle level members of the corporations and not those more responsible, no? Like the personal responsible, but not the president of that moment. And we, uh, senior, we try to uh, construct these trials because of uh, because of the involvement in crimes against humanity, and not be just because they benefited economically of the whole uh, situation. No, this is a, this is a, another uh, big discussion. Thank to, you, Marcela. To... I think okay. yeah, uh, it's answered uh, the question. And unfortunately, we have to conclude now because we have a last session and we uh, also want to leave uh, time for this. I want to thank again the three speakers, David, Emilio, for uh, with us. You are hearing the clap. Uh, and bringing all this to the discussion. So, and thank you so for uh, listening and for your patience. Uh, we'll have a break now and uh, we will back, I think, in 20 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>